Hi, Charlie. Welcome. Thank uh, you. Let's have. A, let's take a moment. Let's take a minute, a moment to to introduce yourself. Just say a few words about. Mm. Okay. You. My name is Charlie Moreno Romero. I'm Colombian. I uh, have lived many years in different parts of the world. Um, but my, my roots, my second home is, is Estonia. And um, originally I started, um, I started philology and literature. Um, my, uh, uh, my, my thirst for knowledge and, and growth took me to uh, anthropology. And I started um, researching education from an anthropological perspective. That was very valuable and, and interesting, and, and uh, I ended up in, in Spain, um, enrolled in a PhD program that was focused on, um, is still focused on um, uh, education for social justice and inclusion. And my research topics was um, about um, um, democratic education. Uh, basically, the research question was, how are these two uh, approaches to education uh, similar, different? How do they support each other? And um, and that was that was a tremendous uh, uh, trip that changed my life, basically. We are introducing a little bit of the questions, but let's uh, let's start. Um, first question: What might be a threshold situation, like a tipping point, in your life or work right now? In mm -hmm. other words, some time for unlearning and new knowledge or ideas to take shape. Okay. Well, at the moment, you know, learning doesn't stop. Um, we have been during the last three years engaged in this democratic education project within a public school in Tallinn. The name of the project is Suvemae. Suvemae is uh, it's a, a, a branch within uh, Tallinn's art gymnasium. Um, so we have, uh, yeah, we have this, this pilot project that, that uh, tries to, to support growth development in different ways. We work really closely to families and we want to engage and involve uh, also civil society to the school. And instead of having an island there based on, on, on the abstract uh, thinking, we would like society to come to school and also bring out uh, Subemai to, to society. So there is a lot of, of learning. There is a lot of unlearning uh, in, in that process. Um, would you like me to explain a little bit what this democratic education thing is uh, sure, uh, all sure. about? Okay, yeah, sure. so according to EUDAC, which is the European Democratic Education Community, there are uh, four, uh, sorry, two uh, main characteristics in democratic education, which is let's say a philosophy, a pedagogical philosophy that has been going on during the last hundred years. Um, first one is um, um, uh, shared decision-making mechanisms, meaning that um, kids and adults have the same rights, duties, um, and they all have a voice and a vote. So they make decisions, uh, they make decisions uh, um, together. For instance, the, you can use headphones, my love. Thank you. Uh, my child is playing the piano there. Um, they make decisions together. Like for instance, what are the school agreements? What are the rules? How to solve conflicts? How to organize uh, different kinds of activities, excursions, celebrations? Um, and this is uh, like, uh, it supports a perspective of um, unempowerment from adults, meaning that adults stop um, solving conflict, stop, um, um, uh, you know, controlling behaviors. And it's rather the community, the school community that engages in that, in that process. Um, another characteristic is uh, self-directed learning, meaning that we are not the same. We are all very different. We have different potentials, different interests. So we try to get to an agreement. We we uh, engage in a dialogue in between the state curriculum and the kids' own interests um, and, and, and skills. And um, instead of focusing so much on the content, 
we focus rather on the development of the learning skills, those soft skills, the 21st century skills. Um, making decisions is tremendously difficult. You know, it's uh, many people are used to others taking that responsibility and telling what to do and how to do. Um, but definitely initiative is one of those characteristics that our societies are, are craving for. Initiative, the ability to connect with others, to work with others, to listen attentively, to display empathy, to display divergent thinking, considering a problem or a challenge from different perspectives. So we are facing these, these processes on a daily basis. Um, and uh, then from my perspective, in addition to these two, there are two more characteristics of democratic education. One is age mixing environments, or age mixed environments where kids of different ages uh, participate in uh, workshops, non-formal learning uh, activities, or just spend time together. Um, you know, it, somehow our segregation by age in conventional schools has become a fetish. Because in the end of the day, you know, conventional schools are based on um, uh, you know, these two mechanisms that control behaviors and, and ways of, of, of uh, interacting, which is the timetable and the curriculum. So uh, when we, uh, what we are trying to do is to provide enough time for them also to have access to other kids from different classes so, uh, or different age groups, let's say and engage in different kinds of, of activities. So they are, the kids are um, um, invited to promote, to propose clubs or different sorts of workshops. Um, and also to, to spend their time, you know, in, 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 in meaningful ways to them. You know, free play is, is also very important. We know we have seen this, um, how, how kids um, engage in conflicts when they are playing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this is a very positive possibility for those, uh, for, for us to, to engage with them into a reason, into a collective wisdom of what do we need to get to an agreement? You know, how, what, when, when was the, the problem starting or, uh, you know, what, what was the root of it? How can we solve it? Instead of us dictating as Solomon King, um, we are just facilitators. So we are providing you know, questions, empathetic understanding, active listening, helping them communicate. Nowadays, um, in, even in, in younger ages, um, speaking about three to five, six-year-old kids, uh, they have really quick access to devices. They know how to surf. They know how to find their games on tablets, on uh, phones, and so they have really limited um, self-regulatory skills. Or they don't know how to communicate, how to deal with other kids, how to uh, connect meaningfully, how to you know try to find solutions together. So this is a process that we are supporting there. So just as a summary, self-directed learning, shared decision-making mechanisms, uh, age-mixed environments, and free play, especially for the younger ones. But also, you know, free play could be uh, uh, you know uh, putting a puzzle together for older kids or, or, or playing cards and uh, playing chess, for instance. Um, and these are you know, really important moments for them because they are finding out who they are. You know, they have lots of questions that are not necessarily in the curriculum and the answer is not in the end of the book. So uh, they need this time to, to reason, to, to reflect about this with their peers. So uh, yeah, that is the tipping moment. Every day is, is a learning experience. Uh, we are Still, we have learned a lot in these two and a half years of SUBMI, but we are still learning of how to um, uh, continue being part of the public um, schooling system while um, promoting a different approach to childhood, one that um, you know, includes the same respect we display to adults being displayed to kids. Um, also releasing, releasing responsibility, releasing power and kids starting to get into those uh, those situations in which uh, you know they, they also need to but they want to go for instance skiing that sounds perfect who is taking responsibility for finding out where we are going to ski how much it costs so maybe they take responsibility maybe they forget so next time it's a reminder and until they take this responsibility things happen right and and they they can feel that there is this this process in which they um they are actively participating in these situations, which is not easy, very challenging, but yeah, learning every day. <laughs>
Charlie, thank you for painting this uh, structural image of this project and the school and democratic-led um, learning. Um, let's see if you already answered or you want to add something else on this question, briefly sharing from your background two, three events or people that shaped your journey as it is till now for democratic, to democratic-led. Okay. Right? Yeah, definitely. There have been many valuable people. First thing, well, uh, you know, when I when I got to um, to identify a democratic school, uh, the name is Ojo de Agua, in between Alicante and Valencia in Spain. Um, then all these conversations with the families, with the um, with the the adults in the space, they were really really important. They were opening new gates and and you know just just inspire, inspiring me to. To, to learn more about this. Uh, then I went to the first IDEC, the International Democratic Education Conference in Israel in 2016. And that was a mind blowing experience in Hadera, uh, listening from the experts, um, from the practitioners. Um, there I met, I met uh, yeah, several people. One of those um, is, is definitely, well, Valerio from, from Peru. Recently he died. But he um, he shared his experience, and, and I'm very glad that, that that I had the chance to to talk to him um, in in this small democratic school on the mountains of Peru. Uh, he was he was a very very interesting, uh, uh, inspiring person. Uh, it's it's really sad that he has left us, uh, but but you know we keep him always uh, close to our hearts. Another person definitely uh, Derry Hannam. Um, former Ofsted inspector in England, who defended he defended uh, Summerhill against uh, against Ofsted when Ofsted wanted to close it down. Uh, a very wise person, very charm, funny, uh, empathetic, supportive. He has been uh, he has been my my support during these two and a half years uh, of of SUVMI. We shared this this idea that. Um, that uh, democratic education cannot be um, uh, only for those who can afford it, but this needs to be uh, a, an alternative for, for the most. So uh, e even if we had to deal with the, with the conventional schooling uh, environment, um, how we can, uh, we, can, um, we can adapt it, how we can provide this, this, this true, truly engaging experience to kids but also to families um and well you know reading materials that have come to my hands amazing you know john taylor gato with a, the nouns of how schooling uh well actually ruins <laughs> has brought us to this critical moment in history um chris mercoliano with the experience in albany preschool i haven't met him but i wish i could uh, visit sometime um albany preschool and uh, yeah, reading about all these cases, you know, uh, uh, Sudbury Valley School, uh, Summerhill, we are collaborating now with Summerhill closely. Um, and we are participating in, in, in the organization of uh, the Festival of Childhood, Summerhill Festival of Childhood that will happen in August 2022. Everybody is more than invited. We will have tremendously interesting activities there. And it's, it's a festival to celebrate childhood, to, to uh, you know, highlight uh, the, the rights that children, boys and girls have around the world and how we can actually promote a more holistic, more respectful um, uh, growth, growing uh, environments for them. Um, and definitely what the, the person who has inspired me to get through this, to, through this path um, is, is my own daughter, mm -hmm. who is over there. Uh, Sophie, come and say hello. <laughs> Um, because uh, she is in my life, then I started. Hi, so <laughs> We I started to to find to look for for possibilities, for for alternatives. So she she definitely was. Um, you know, I came from a very conventional schooling system, a male only school with uh, even physical punishments, lots of humiliation and you know, bullying, also from adults. This brought me to a perspective. Um, of, of, of questioning, right? I came also from an educator family and, uh, and they were doing things in different ways. My, my aunts, they're very close to, 
human right education. My uncle is uh, the best language teacher I know uh, who has used language to convey citizenship, global unity. Um, and, and they were they were fundamental. But I think that this one is is like um, like the reason why I, I got into education so, so much trying to find alternatives and create them. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you have already mentioned a little bit about the future, but um, we can continue on that, the future that emerges. What is a pu possible future that emerges for you right now? One idea that you feel you are called, maybe it's the October 2022, but let's see. And what would you like to see up there, out there in education in one to three years? Yeah, well, we have this, this project with Subamaya at least until during the next two years. Since the very beginning, what we have meant to do, what we have wanted to do was to, to, to build an alternative, as, as Derry Hannam calls it, this a pioneer of opportunities, of possibilities. Mm, I, um, well, Estonia, Estonia has been in my life for many, many years. I feel that, you know, one thing that identifies Estonia is that it's really tiny, it's really small. And, and, and the locals uh, sometimes even complain or like they, they regret that it's so small. But actually, in, from my perspective, this is, this is an advantage because whenever you want to um, impulse, to give a push to change at the social level, uh, the, the, the limited space, the dimensions makes it more possible to connect with people. This has happened for us lately, even though the state support is not so evident, we are happening. And this is really important. I feel that um, democratic education within public schooling needs to be an alternative. It needs to be a, a possibility for families, uh, for those kids and those families who feel that, um, you know, uh, the segregation by age doesn't make sense. We are missing Piaget, Vygotsky, scaffolding, growing from each other. We are missing hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary psychology of how we learn from others and we are just putting kids into boxes according to their age. The idea that subjects are divided and, and, and they are not connected as the world, you know, that, that through music we cannot learn um, uh, history or math. Um, uh, this pushes us to, to promote a holistic approach where we can learn about the history of ballet um, and, and at the same time, learn about the conditions where, where this was born and, and learn about the people themselves, not only the big names, which usually are male, but also, um, also about the, the people, right? Um, rescue those people who are um, usually invisible. Um, and that is something that, that I feel that, that we are managing at, at school. You know, people are, uh, students are making research about the great women in art and, um, uh, you know, sexual diversity rights and uh, environmental um, environmental uh, rights and environmental justice for all. So we are engaged also in these kind of projects. Um, and I feel that this is needed. Um, the 19th century, 18th century uh, school was useful for the industrial society. People needed to, um, you know, be able to follow orders, instructions, uh, don't think too much, just follow the line, you know, the, the, the usual step, uh, life steps that you finish school, uh, go to university, get a job and, and just you know, go to pension after that. That is over. We need people to know how to deal with uh, change, who display initiative, who can connect with others, who can have imagination, creativity. Uh, we, we have, unfortunately, we'll continue raising kids to, to be individualistic, to be self-centered, not to think on, of, of the environment so much, um, uh, just you know, to, to achieve for themselves. It's really hard to break those cycles. We believe it is possible, but for that we need to do things in, in different ways. Um, so yeah, my goal is that. My goal is to continue connecting with people uh, during the next uh, years um and, and supporting every possibility you know for kids to um learn in, in in different ways multiple ways but especially within the framework of social justice and human rights 
this is this is very important that that we stop with this authoritarianism that um, that has brought us you know, to this moment in history. I, I, I don't believe it is it is the solution. Mm. Thank you, Charlie, for this point. Um, and the last question: How do we engage meaningfully with um, traditional and indigenous wisdom for the future of education? Yeah, that is that is a really interesting question. I feel that um, we are still trapped within this um, dualistic mindset, the scientific revolution. I don't have anything against science. I trust science, uh, but I do not trust um, um, something which is called in social sciences a coloniality, mm-hmm. which means um, you know, we, have, we have an Eurocentric background in terms of what is acceptable um, uh, as knowledge. We have built a series of subjectivities, gender-wise, uh, age-wise, based on, on those ideas. And we have organized our societies around a very, hierarch- very hierarchical structures where some people decide and some other people just follow orders. We need to break with this. We need to bring more, um, you know, our, our, what I was meaning about uh, age mixed environments, for instance, we need to bring more the, the natural side of, side of learning. We understand nowadays that um, whenever a person is not emotionally stable, doesn't feel that he or she can, it's very difficult for this person to engage in meaningful learning. So how do we actually start considering education, not as schooling, but education as a, a gate to people's happiness, to, to the discovery of the potential? This, this was something that struck me because in many cases, when I speak with people, they ask me, okay, but what are the results of this um, democratic education? So I, I need to tell them there are, there are limited, but there are uh, research studies about the graduates of those schools. Um, in many cases, um, uh, they are people who um, found their passion, their potential, thanks to the fact that they could use their time, part of their time freely. They could connect to others. They could speak um, with people of different ages. They could be very assertive emotionally. Um, we need to recover that. that, that it's, more, it's more about... Um, uh, the human side of education rather than the bureaucratic side of it. Now we want to measure everything. You know, <laughs> I remember having an argument once uh, after one year of school uh, of Subemai, uh, uh, somebody told me, okay, but how do you know that the kids have learned? What have they learned? And I was like, well, this question makes no sense. First of all, it's the first year. We started in a very crazy way. Most democratic schools start with 10 kids, eight kids, Young ones, we started with 65 from the first class to the ninth class. So this was like uh, trying to establish, to build school culture, which only now we can see that is happening, right? So we now have the shared agreements. Now uh, kids are not interrupting so often each other when they are speaking in our school meeting or in the small meetings that we have uh, uh, age-wise or or group-wise. so it, we want to measure everything. You know, we want, uh, sometimes we get families who, who hear about self-directed learning and they're expected, expecting self-directed learners after a month, um, which is not possible. First of all, we need to deal with, with all the issues that have to do with self-regulation, with connecting with others, talking to others, something which is very clear. We speak about uh, school hangover in, in, at Suvema. When kids come from conventional schools and they, for instance, have a very fixed idea of how learning happens. So learning only happens when the teacher tells me what to do. Learning only happens when I get um, grades for, for, my, for my work or whatever I do. Um, learning only happens when um, I, I can get numeric f- feedback but at the same time low self-esteem very poor social skills screen dependency so we have an, a situation nowadays when our kids cannot get bored when you and me we were children 
we used to get bored and then we would find activities, right? There was, I remember only one hour of, of a, a, a children focus or children address, a children meant TV show mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Colombia. And then the rest of the time we had to find our, our activities, right? Play by yourself, use your imagination, go out and play with the neighbors. Um, nowadays, uh, kids have, have a very easy entertaining machine at hand. And parents are giving it like, like if it was candy, uh, even candy is already problematic. Um, so they don't get bored. And when they don't get bored, um, they have very little initiative, creativity. This is also part of the school hangover that we talked about. So we need to deal with those. First of all, you know, we, we promote um, a, a learning environment in which around 60% of the time we have some sort of semi-structured learning activities because we need to deal with the state curriculum. And 40% of the time is the learner's time. So they decide what they want. How do we get into agreement as to uh, using different resources or what time it's, it, it is um, appropriate to use uh, telephones or iPads for, for entertainment? We cannot be Sudbury Valley School. I'm not saying anything bad about them, but we are within the public system. We have uh, lots of controls which we need to deal with those. So it is, it is I feel like a very productive and, and useful um, compromise in between freedom and responsibility. Of course, we are not learning history based on dates, but uh, we get to we get to to connect somehow the in students' interests with some history topics, and then we help them develop research projects as to develop those learning skills. Um, we are you know competent. I am able to do something. Autonomy, which is I am able to regulate to focus my, organize my time, to focus on my learning. If I find a question, then I will ask, or I have a problem, then I ask for support. And then oracy, how I speak, I convey my, my ideas to others. So um, we, are, we are focusing on those, on the development of these three skills while, while building a school uh, uh, culture that is respectful, inclusive. Um, it's a very interesting thing, especially for instance, helping kids um, uh, deal with conflicts. We have a mediation circle, five kids and one adult, and we meet every day. Uh, and, and we are asking questions, you know, and we are deploying active listening, empathetic understanding, and trying to listen more to the to the to the kids. We need to uh, stop just following um, this education or schooling fetishes that that make little sense. Uh, for anyone who is interested, I suggest Melton. He is a historian, and he wrote a book about instruction and absolutism in um, in Prussia. Uh, these are the origins of our schooling uh, habits, uh, and we continue replicating them. I'm speaking about early 18th century, so we need to reframe how we are actually dealing with kids. Uh, the idea of, of punishment and reward, this doesn't work, especially when we want to deploy or, or to, to develop, help them develop uh, those uh, learning skills, which cannot be measured with exams. Oh, Charlie, thank you. Listening to you, uh, what it comes to me is that we actually have to access what is very close to us, wisdom, and wisdom is in the relation learning relations, student, student, exactly. student, teacher. And what is needed for that is uh, an emotion of courage, just standing and then awareness, no judging, just looking awareness, courage, and then accessing wisdom and facilitating wisdom. For Absolutely. Students. And we are not perfect, you know, sometimes we make mistakes and, and this has happened to us that, um, and kids also see it and, and reflect on that. We make mistakes, for instance, sometimes I have just, you know, lost my patient. <sighs> Later on, I come and say, guys, I'm so sorry. What I did shouldn't have happened. And this is this ability of understanding which we want them to, to, to get really internalized. Mistakes are good. We make mistakes, then we learn. Our schooling system is uh, based on mistakes, uh, you know, punishment for mistakes. So people stop taking initiative, stop trying something new. 
I'm just waiting for you to tell me what is acceptable. Then I will get into it. Otherwise, quiet. Yeah. They do like this all the time. My dear, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, how how to get them to recover their voice is, is a big process. And emotions are exactly, these are the pillars. How kids feel. They feel accepted. Not that they are allowed to everything. We need limits. Yeah. We need boundaries. They feel accepted. They feel welcome. They feel that they belong to the place. Then something can start happening. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you very much for joining and for having this interview with us. Thank you, Andrea. It's, it's a real pleasure. I hope to uh, continue connecting with people like you who are betting for changing the, the educational landscape. Uh, and we need to join forces. So now there is the uh, Youth Rights uh, Day. I ask everybody to uh, connect on Facebook. This is really important because we need less adults speaking and more young people getting to say, you know, how they're feeling, to, to demand their rights. Um, uh, Article 12 of the Convention of Children's Rights, I think I shared it with you last time. Children and young people are entitled to be consulted whenever a decision is made that affect, affects them. Uh, this doesn't happen. <laughs> it is not happening. So how, how do we actually make it happen? That is something that we need all to, to join forces to, to achieve. Thank you, Charlie, so much. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. A pleasure.